Election after election in Australia, politicians sacrifice themselves to climate change, promising to do more to destroy the Australian coal industry and make our energy supply more costly and insecure. You see, it's our version of Groundhog Day. Every election from state to federal, get rid of that stinking coal. And while they like the idea of renewable energy, voters don't like paying the high prices that go with it. Radical climate change policies and the parties promoting them are rejected time and again. But it matters not what the people want. Climate change policies and their destructive goals become ever more entrenched with the advocacy from global, corporate and vested interests. Most of us know little about the science or whether human-induced climate change is responsible for the bushfires, the droughts and the hurricanes, and that we're told are growing in intensity. Too bad that climate policies will do nothing to address this. And why is the, this debate so lopsided? Why is it always focused on renewable energy? What about carbon capture? What about nuclear energy capacity? That's if emissions are really of concern. Me, I love coal. There is a lot of BS around right now. Today, we talk to Gregory Wrightstone, Executive Director of the CO2 Coalition. Gregory has been accepted as an expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He is the author of the best-selling book, Inconvenient Facts, The Science That Al Gore Doesn't Want You To Know. The CO2 Coalition was established in 2015 to educate thought leaders, policymakers, and the public about the important contribution made by carbon dioxide to our lives and the economy. We are told the debate on climate change is over. We are told people are dying from a climate crisis. We are told the world will end in 12 years. We are told this is our fault, all caused by carbon dioxide created by the energy that powers our lives. This is not true. These claims are not supported by the data to date. We are the CO2 Coalition, a research organization of over 50 climate scientists and energy economists. We are saving the people of the planet from the people who claim they are saving the planet. We are changing the conversation about climate and carbon dioxide, a mild warming gas and a powerful plant food. We know the benefits of CO2. Food can be grown where it wasn't grown before. It has increased crop harvest by a third. Farmers pump it into their greenhouses to produce more food for your family. NASA satellites tell the story. CO2 has greened the globe in the last 100 years. Many deserts are shrinking because of new plant growth. Trees are growing larger and more efficient with less water required. CO2 is a beneficial byproduct of the cheap, reliable energy that is raising life expectancy all over the world. Even the UN admits there has been no increase in hurricanes, droughts, floods, and rate of sea level rise in the last 100 years. Politicians are pushing policies which will reduce our prosperity and jeopardize our food security. So why give in to fear and destroy our economy when we can reduce poverty, improve health and longevity? Increase prosperity for billions around the world. Join us today to protect our future and give everyone a chance. Carbon dioxide, part of a greener future. Gregory Wrightstone is the executive director of the CO2 Coalition and the author of the fabulous book, Inconvenient Facts, the science that Al Gore doesn't want you to know. Greg, thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. Glad to join you. Tell me, the CO2 Coalition, um, can I ask you how you got involved and why you got involved? It, it might be better to start with how I got involved in this subject, if you don't mind, because as a geologist a number of years ago, uh, I, I heard things about climate change that as a scientist and a geologist I knew was incorrect. Uh, I suspected other things were, were incorrect as well. The science weren't backing them up. Um, and really my involvement in climate change and exploration of climate change was really a, a personal search for the truth. And that's, uh, that's what led me to uh, writing Inconvenient Facts, 
uh, and, and go from there. Tell us about the CO2 Coalition, uh, their mission and agenda for 2021. And you've got to cut through all the all the COVID air and you've got to cut through the, the, the Trump air, which is still there to get your message out. How do you do that? Well, it's difficult. We're, uh, in, in fact, we're, we're actually able to get our message out, but we tend to preach to the choir. Mm. It's, it's so difficult uh, to, to communicate our message of a, of a thriving and benefiting earth uh, to the other side that, that's the, in this cancel culture that we have right now. Although I'll be doing that uh, on Wednesday morning in two days, uh, to the, I'll be giving a presentation, hour-long presentation, to the Golden Gate uh, Breakfast Club in, in San Francisco. Uh, so it's a great opportunity there. Uh, but the, the CO2 Coalition's a, a group of about 60, uh, some of the top scientists in the world that have hold a skeptical view about climate change. They include people like uh, Dr. Will Happer uh, of Princeton, atmospheric physicist, Dr. Richard Lins, and another atmospheric physicist, and Pat Michaels, a famed climatologist. So we've got this, I like to think of the CO2 coalition as being the tip of the spear uh, when it comes to uh, promoting the facts and the science about climate change that doesn't toe the company line, that doesn't agree with the consensus opinion of man-made catastrophic warming. Um, and we, we've been very effective. Uh, again, I'm, I'm doing interviews. We were recruiting Patrick Moore, uh, who was next uh, co-founder of Greenpeace. Uh, he's one of these Michael Schellenberger types that have uh, gone over that were radical environmentalists that have come over and seen the light that uh, the, the the cure, kind of like the COVID, maybe the cure is worse than the, the disease. Their cure for climate change uh, seems to be we need to destroy the planet in order to save the planet. Uh, so Patrick Moore's uh, been a been a great spokesman for us. Um, and again, he just stepped down as chair of the uh, CO2 coalition. Uh, so we got this this strong uh, population of just great scientists. Emergency mm -hmm. is a favourite word at the moment with the Biden administration. We have COVID emergency, <laughs> heaven help us, Trump emergency. And now climate emergency. Emergency sort of allows government to do things they really couldn't do before. Is, okay, is there a climate emergency? Oh, absolutely not. And in fact, what we find, what I find in my book, I'm researching um, for my second book right now. Well, what I find and what we promote is that we look at the modest warming that we've seen over the last 100 plus years, and, and yes, we're in a warming trend. We can talk about that in a bit. The, the modest warming we've seen combined with increasing CO2 is leading to an earth that's thriving, benefiting, and prospering. Uh, this, and again, the CO2 coalition was named that because that's one of our primary functions is to promote the beneficial role that's increasing CO2 has on the earth's ecosystems and, and by extension on humanity. The human condition is improving because of increased CO2. And I'm, a, uh, in fact, I just got my new uh, I love CO2 face masks in today. <laughs> so uh, we just got those. And I, I sometimes go to the gym wearing my I love CO2 T-shirt. So we're, we're huge proponents of, of the many benefits of CO2. We're told by the media and by the governments that CO2 is the demon molecule uh, it's it's the reason, it's the thing that's leading, and that's that's what they're targeting, aren't they? They're targeting carbon dioxide mm. uh, as as being the culprit for what they're calling catastrophic man-made warming. Uh, but it's not. We're seeing the many benefits, including primarily uh, the CO2 fertilization effect. Increasing CO2 means that plants grow bigger, faster. Um, we're growing much greater crops because of that. And think of it, about it, too, uh, a modest warming that we've seen mean, is leading to increased growing seasons in the temperate regions. We've killing frosts end earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall because of modest warming. Uh, we're also seeing the plan, according to uh, NASA here in the United States, their satellites report that up to 50 percent of the Earth's surface is what they call greening. In other words, vegetation is increasing. Less than 4%, less than 4% of the Earth's surface is what they call browning or uh, 
loss of vegetation. Completely opposite. You're going to hear me say that more than once tonight. It's completely opposite of what we're being told. We're being told that deserts are expanding when, in fact, the fact of the matter is deserts are shrinking. And it's because of a combination of a slight increase in precipitation due to warming and increasing uh, CO2 content, uh, which means that plants can tolerate drier conditions better with more CO2. They don't need as much as much water uh, mm. to survive. So we think, see things, probably one of the greatest examples uh, we can point to is the Southern Sahara, an area known as the Sahel, uh, that's actually, uh, people are moving, turning into the lush grassland. People have moved back in there that haven't lived there in a thousand years. Uh, people are, are growing crops there again in former desert. And we see this in your Australia, China, and India, uh, arid areas that are actually greening. Uh, and again, it's just opposite of what we're being told. They always say you're all, I mean, my, my family are very much on the, uh, on the other side, um, but they still talk to me at times. Uh, but they always say, follow the science. It's the science, follow the science. And if you throw anything up, they'll quote a whole bunch of things at you, throw them back at you and say, see, it's all about the science and yours is not. What do you say to that? Well, I can tell you with the science that I see, and again, I'm a geologist, so I look at the big picture. Uh, I, I can point to things. Let's just let's, let's explore just one example. Um, there was a, uh, that, that gives you an example of what we're talking about here, uh, of how it's distorted. There was a UN report uh, in late 2019 that was issued on biodiversity. Uh, there was a claim in this report that uh, up to one million species were go going to go extinct over the next several decades. Uh, well, I, I, my alarm bells started going off when I read that. I got into it. Well, it would, that would require 25,000 to 30,000 extinctions per year uh, over the next several decades. So I went back and looked at the UN report and the data. And in the UN report, they went back to the year 1500. They had 500 years of data, but they only had one data point per century. Well, I went back and looked at it on a decade by decade, every 10 years, at the very same data they used and found that the facts supported a significant decrease in extinction starting in the early 1900s. Around the 20th, early 20th century uh, extinctions. So again, we, we talked about 25,000 to 30,000 extinctions being required to get to that 1 million extinction mark. You know what it's been for the last 40 years? Two, two, mm. not 2,000, mm. not 200, two extinctions per year. Oh, they say, well, we're going to get to 25,000 pretty soon. No, we're not. No, we're not. The big story should have been from that UN report, just opposite of what they claim. The big, the big story from that UN report should have been, we are doing a really, really, really good job protecting our endangered species, and we should keep it up. And that's something everyone should celebrate. But instead, they turned the statistics uh, upside down and tortured the statistics until they got the answer they wanted. And I see things like that time and time again. Uh, and this was in the U.S. congressional testimony. They used my research and my work uh, in open congressional testimony with the U.N. scientists sitting there with egg on their face because they had been exposed. Uh, and I see it time and time again. Uh, we, again, we have, we have some of the top scientists in the world. Uh, Dr. Will Happer just published uh, a new study uh, concerning climate modeling, uh, showing how the climate models way, way, way over predict warming for the future uh, compared to what it actually is. And so we're, our, our goal there, I look at the CO2 coalition as being the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, promoting the science, the facts and the data. Back to, you know, the they say follow the science. and It is the science, the consensus amongst uh, ninety nine point nine nine percent of uh, the scientists say uh, we have a climate emergency. Uh, question being, I mean, how I look at it is that you keep pushing out information that's not right, shut down the information that is right. Uh, all of a sudden, the information that is not right is the only information. Uh, go back to because as as our as as the students at school get older and they get out into the workforce and have families and they're still being taught the same thing. And all of a sudden the family unit believes in 
in, in climate change and that it's destroying the planet. And before you know it, you have this consensus on misinformation from the very start. Why is there this discrepancy between a whole bunch of scientists who they promote as saying there is climate change and it's destroying the planet. And on the other side, there's people like yourself and other scientists who say this is just pure bunkum and misinformation. But you guys don't get that, you know, that, that uh, drum roll. You're not, you're not going to be invited to stay on stage to talk about that. How do you get around that? Why is there this discrepancy between scientists? Well, that's, that's the big challenge we have is getting that message out there. Uh, as to the discrepancy, uh, I think there are a number of scientists that would like to speak out. It takes a it takes a really, really brave person. You'll find that most of the skeptical scientists that are part of our coalition or uh, that are speaking out are either tenured or retired. And there's mm -hmm. a reason for that, because if you're if you're not tenured, you're you and you speak out and fight back against what I call the company line or the con consensus opinion, you risk losing your job. You risk losing your, fun your, your funding. You, you're going to face scorn and derision from your colleagues. Um, it's, it takes a brave person to do that. And there, it turns out there aren't very many brave persons. Um, and I, I just look, my second book that I'm, I'm looking at, I'm working on right now, um, we're, I'm looking at Dr. Michael Mann from Penn State, he developed what was called the hockey stick of uh, un saying that there's unusual and unprecedented warming for on a scale of thousands of years. It's never been this warm before. Uh, but if you look at the data that he and his acolytes use, uh, it's tortured. It's, it's just horrible, horrible, horrible data. Another good example, he and his acolytes are basing this idea of unusual and unprecedented warming primarily on a tree found in the southwest of the United States, it's called a bristlecone pine. The people that studied that particular tree, in their studies, they warned, do not use this tree ring data for temperature reconstructions, because it's based on precipitation. And that's, that is why we're doing a lot of this. It's based on Michael Mann's work of un and claims of unusual and unprecedented warming, when the very basis uh, can be called into question and proven uh, beyond a doubt that the data that he used was was should not have been used to come to his conclusions. Uh, so we're, we explore that data, uh, explore another. You, you, when you read my, my next book, if you're not outraged at the abuse of the scientific process, um, the, 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 I, I would call I would call your 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 abilities into question because I just I look back and I just shake my head at some of these studies that are done that just cherry pick data, uh, selectively use data, and ignore other data that doesn't uh, conform with their preconceived notions. So I go back to, to these other scientists. It takes, it takes a brave person. Uh, we've seen time and time again those people that have spoken up, Peter Ridd in, in your country, uh, who, who was saying, no, 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 there is no great crisis at the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I think he's still battling he for his back in court. position at mm. the university. Mm. And, and look at just using him as an example. Uh, he's a classic example of what you do when, when your science, and he's very science and factual, when your science doesn't conform with the, their preconceived notion of man-made catastrophic warming, uh, that, that's what you get. Peter Ridd. It's really scary. Um... When, when I have conversations with people about climate change, uh, I always see this frenzied person. The eyes get wider, the pupils get smaller. They just, it's like almost a, uh, this, like a cult. Uh, and I actually see it as you know, misinformation, you know, which is, which is very, very dangerous. It's going to affect humanity and the planet. And as you said, they're going to destroy the planet. Um, I see that happening unless, unless we can cut through that air, and I don't know how you're going to do that because I see big tech, uh, government, mainstream it, media going to shut you down before you get started. Yeah, I mean, if if, if you have any ideas, I'm all ears. I want to find <laughs> out about it. We're exploring different options, but it's we're facing it's a tough road to hoe for us uh, to get this message out there. And again, I I get so frustrated because we have the scientific basis that's saying no. And again, I I look at the 
at the big picture. Uh, look, maybe we should just, what, what do 97% of the scientists believe? Mm. Uh, they probably believe what I do, mm. is that we're in a warming trend, okay? It started more than 300 years ago in the late 17th century. So we've been warming for 300 years. CO2 is increasing, yes. And I believe that, and most scientists believe that that increase in CO2 is from mainly the burning of fossil fuels, a little bit of cement manufacture. Um, and I believe that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it has a warming effect on the atmosphere. I just believe that the warming effect it has is, is very modest and overwhelmed by those same forces that have been driving temperature since the dawn of time. Uh, and I, one of the things I, I like to do, Mike, is to go back. Uh, and that's what I'm doing in my second book, is taking a, a much longer picture uh, relating the rise and fall of temperature to the rise and fall of civilizations. And it's fascinating, the mm. strong relationship uh, between temperature and humanity. Mm. We go back to the first civilizations 5,000 years ago. These great empires arose about that time. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Hittites uh, in India and in China, these great civilizations, all, all about the same time. It was due, due to one of the warmest periods we've had in the last 5,000 years. It was mm. called the Bronze Age, the Minoan Warm Period. And it was thing, everybody thrived in this great time of warming that was much warmer than today. And then it started getting cold. And within about 100 years of this temperature drop, all of these great civilizations collapsed. It was called the Late Bronze Age Collapse. And it's what we see in each one of them. We're, we're in the fourth great warming period over the last 5,000 years. Mm. Each of the previous warming periods were warmer than we are today, and all of them experienced just tremendous benefits to humanity. Great civilizations arose, uh, and then when it started getting cold, each one of those cooling periods was the same thing occurred every time. Crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation was accompanied the cooling effects. Mm. And I'll say it again, it's just opposite of what we're being told. Isn't yeah. it? We're being told, oh my God, we can't let it get another degree and a half or two degrees warmer. We're all gonna we're gonna die and there's gonna be famine and we're all gonna die. Well that's not what human history tells us. Mm. Human mm. history and climate tell us that we should welcome the warmth and we should fear the cold. Um, Really, really bad things happen when it gets cold systematically every time. And we don't we don't hear anything about this. Mm. Uh, there was a reason the Romans wore togas, Mike. It was really warm. And that was that was during the Roman warm period. Um, and, and the most recent warm period was called the medieval warm period. It was known as the high Middle Ages when uh, for centuries people prospered and thrived. Uh, and then it, the the cold that led us into what was called the Little, Little Ice Age ushered in a, another era uh, of terrible famine and pestilence and mass depopulation. It's thought that up to a third of the population of the Earth perished during that time. Half the population of Iceland perished during that time. And it wasn't from because it got too warm. It was because of the cold. Uh, and there's not much we can do when crops start failing. The mm. next time it gets cold, Mike, it won't be as bad because... We're not moving food around with ox carts and we have refrigeration. Uh, but when it starts getting cold, it's likely that we're going to experience uh, great trials and tribulations. So, again, if, if there's nothing your your viewers take away from this, uh, they should remember, welcome the warmth and fear the cold. How would someone find out more about the CO2 Coalition and where can they get before Amazon take it off? off the shelves, uh, the uh, inconvenient facts, the science that Al Gore doesn't want you to know. How would they either get your book or how would they yeah, find CO out more about the CO2 Coalition? CO2 Coalition, we have a, our website is the CO2Coalition.org or CO2Coalition.org. You can learn, you can buy my book, Inconvenient Facts. And we were recently a number one bestseller uh, on Amazon here in the United States just last week. I think we're down to number two today, but that, that, that bears testament. Uh, it's written for non-scientists, or you can go to my website. I've got some great information there, inconvenientfacts.xyz. You can go look at some of my videos. A great one I'll recommend is the relationship between uh, uh, the witch hunts of the late Middle Ages in Europe and climate. 
Mm. Uh, and to learn more, go 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 check that out. I recommend that. Hopefully, it doesn't follow the same uh, path though as Dr. Zeus, <laughs> but, and he he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, Gregory, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gregory Wrightstone. Now, finally, in Australia, we must not criticise our vaccine rollout. It's safe. However, the countries suspending use of AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine are Denmark, Norway, Ireland, Estonia, the Netherlands, Thailand, Bulgaria, Iceland, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Latvia, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Cyprus, Portugal and Slovenia. As Senator Matt Canavan tweeted, we should pause the rollout of AstraZeneca vaccine because almost every European country now has concerns over its safety. There is no imminent threat of coronavirus here, so why would we blindly rush on when others are concerned? And that's it for Asia Pacific Today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Ryan.